chamber. Great to have everyone on today, both uh, via Zoom or if, if you're uh, calling in via Zoom as well. Um, as a chamber, we are uh, excited to continue to support uh, the needs of our, our businesses, and we think this is a, a great way to do that as we are, are uh, getting back to business, and, and we're excited to continue to support our businesses in that. Um, uh, a couple of reminders, a media reminder, if you are a member of the media, uh, we would ask that you would remove yourself from the webinar at this time. Uh, interviews will be available um, after, the webinar, after the webinar if desired. Um, I will note that the webinar is being recorded today, so just uh, good to make note of that. Um, I think we're all getting to be pros at Zoom, but I would ask that if you're not speaking, go ahead and mute yourself. Um, just for feedback purposes there. Um, and uh, throughout the webinar today, uh, we've got a, a great uh, group of, of speakers, panelists today. Um, if you've got questions, go ahead and chat those questions into the chat box, and then I will go ahead and facilitate those questions towards the end of our webinar or our time today. So throughout, throughout our time, go ahead, chat those uh, questions in. Um, and finally, I will uh, we'll go ahead and, and uh, ask our panel to, to introduce themselves. We've got a great group of individuals joining us today from, from uh, every, everyone from the state to county and then local businesses as well um, to really give great perspective on how we can continue uh, to, to move our area forward and, and reopen our businesses. So with that, uh, I'll go ahead and ask uh, those individuals as it, the time comes to unmute themselves. And we'll start uh, with Nalita. If you could just give a quick introduction, you know, your title, your organization, and then we'll just go down the line from there. Thanks, Josh, for having us. So I'm Nalita with WEDC, the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. I am the Regional Economic Development Director for Brown County as a whole. I cover eight counties in the state. Um, so if there's ever a question or a need from a community or a business, usually I'm your starting point to help identify different resources throughout the state that might be able to assist. Thanks, Nalita. And uh, Ted. Good afternoon. My name is Ted Shove. I'm a registered sanitarian here with Brown County Public Health. And I am also the Environmental Health and Laboratory Manager. Thanks, Ted. And then uh, Addie, I think I see Addie on there. Yeah. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Addie Teeters. I'm the head of marketing, communications, and public affairs for Ulster Munch Joe. Um, you may, for the greater Green Bay area, you may more recognize us as the Nicolay Mill in De Pere, right near St. Norbert College. We also have paper plants in um, the Big Tilmany Mill in Kakana and also Rhinelander and Mosinee, in addition to being a part of a, a much larger global network of paper manufacturing throughout the world. So glad to be here and hoping I can um, provide some assistance today. Thanks so much, Addie. And then uh, I'm not sure if, if Amy is on. Uh, she might be on a different screen. Amy, are, are you on to give an introduction to yourself? I don't see her quite yet, so hopefully she will join us in just a little bit here. Um, so then we'll go right ahead. And uh, Jess, uh, if you could introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Jess Miller. I'm the owner operator of Hagemeister Park, Greystone Ale House, and the Bar Restaurants. Thanks, Jess. Uh, again, appreciate all of our, our panelists being on today. Um, we'll go ahead and start with Nalita. Um, if you want to give a, uh, uh, some uh, background on, on the business grant guidelines from the state perspective and share some of your insights there. And again, reminder, go ahead, chat your questions in as you think of them in the chat box. So Nalita, I'll hand it over to you. So it, is it okay if I share, I guess it was easiest for screen to share this? Yeah, and absolutely. I did should. put together some resources and links and things. So I don't know if that can be shared after the Zoom. Yeah, if you want to, yep, we can do that uh, after. And if you do want to share your screen now, if you've got something specific, feel free to do so as well. Give me a minute. I was, I wasn't quite sure exactly how this works. So let's try this. Um, I think you should be able to. Is that, hold on. Now I'm I'm completely messed up here, so, so I no worries. <laughs> Give me a minute. Um, as you've said, we're getting a little bit used to the whole. Right, thing. right. So let me share my screen. Um, huh. Nalita, I have it ready. If you want me to share my screen. Um. Oh, there we go. Oh, am I getting? Let's see. How's this? Does that look right? Got it. Yep. That's it. All right. There we go. 
So I just want to, you know, WDC has been obviously working very diligently over this difficult time. We, we really want to connect with our businesses and our, and honestly, it's even our, our the employees, the residents of the state of Wisconsin, and with regards to how do you really navigate through COVID-19. This is a, it's a, obviously unprecedented. Everybody says it's the new norm, right? You, you, you heard it all. Um, so I think it's one of those things that we're, we're really trying to help. And obviously, I just want to point out our mission is really to maximize the opportunities in Wisconsin for businesses, community. And we, again, going back to the people, we want to see people thrive in Wisconsin. And so we don't do this by ourselves. And I think that's the one thing that I think you may see continually through um, any resources we develop, things like that. You'll see most of our resources, we're very engaged with a lot of our partnership. Um, we very much value the partnership that we have in Wisconsin with regards to whether it be the chambers, whether it be the local and regional economic development organizations, the municipalities, you know, for a long time prior to COVID, workforce training was the number one issue. And so, you know, we work very hard to make sure that we're, we're integrating with our partners and making sure that we're connecting with them throughout all of this. Some of the other resources I want to make before we get into the guidelines that we have developed as well as the WDC um, has developed some ongoing resources to help connect with businesses. And so one of the things that we did develop is a focus forward, which is there's Monday morning is a live stream event. And then there's a video archive regarding reopening, regarding what businesses are addressing. Um, things that they may, you know, just be interested in. And so whether and it ranges from small businesses to large business to, hey, this is the state of Wisconsin right now. And I will make a plug as well for the regional economic development organization. So New North has also partnered with all of the other regional economic development organizations to do a weekly um, webinar with special with experts in the field with regards to not just healthcare, but then also different industries and what's going on with those industries. The other tool that was developed, and this is something that I think um, was developed very early on with regards to helping to address once we went into safer at home. Um, and really looking at how do we help our small businesses thrive in this environment, um, knowing that they're going to have a, there's a disconnect with customers, right? And so if they're not used to online sales, how do you set up your, your, that, that constant communication, that touch points? Um, we did develop a PDF to respond to that and help provide a guide to small businesses and, and looking at online sales, looking at how do you do takeout if that's not something you were used to. But the other thing that it really does is also has a really good tool guide for communities as ideas on how do you help support your small businesses. So what are some strategies that might be out there? And I just want to make sure that you're aware of that. And again, it may not, it may be a one-off, but I think it gets the documents done really well and it helps you think maybe outside the box. And maybe those ideas aren't perfect for you, but if you do a twist on some of those ideas, it might work out really well. And, you know, right now, I think everybody's in the place of, you know, when and how should I open, right? And so uh, I think that's the, the biggest question out there. I know I, I've, met, I've talked to a number of businesses over the course of the last several weeks, specifically with the launch of our, our new grant, um, but they just don't know what they need to do or what the best resources are. And so actually the CDC has a decision matrix um, that I thought was, again, getting, at least asking yourself those right questions of how do you open are you and, and making sure that you feel comfortable opening for your employees for your staff um, for your customers and and looking at what needs to be in place to help make sure that we feel safe and then I, I think the best partner in all of this is the local health department and Ted will I think talk a little bit on this as well with regards to what they've been working on and, and the resources he's he's been one of my allies when it comes to this so um, I think that you know this goes hand in hand um, with regards to reopening so WDC did create guidelines for reopening and, there, and we did industry specific guidelines. And so these do continue to evolve over the course of the last few months, um, but it, it starts off with everything from general, right? What are the best social distancing practices and how do you protect your customers and your employees? But it also goes into more specifics as far as entertainment and amusement and those that are high touch points. Um, we do partner with DHS, so the Department of Health and Human Services with regards to some of their more specific guidelines like that address swimming and, and swimming pools and, and flash pads and, and those type of things. Um, but if you go online to our website, all of these guidelines are there and they're, they're a format that you can kind of look and say, okay, this is what I need to do to help protect my employees and, and again, my customers. And I have the links there so that if you need that resource, it's there. And then I, 
we know this is going to take some resources, right? This is this is taking financial resources from every angle possible, um, from SBA, right, and, and the launch of their programs. WDC did launch two programs in the in in the previous months. So our SB 2020, and I mentioned that we had that, we partnered with our CDFIs. And that was a really a mechanism to get money out very quickly. Um, that is now obviously closed. And then we also did just recently, um, we are actually awarding this week, um, the Ethnic Minority Emergency Grant for Ethnic Minority Businesses. And then our exciting one though, that we're very excited about that we think is gonna have the biggest impact in the state is that we're, that we're all in grant, which the application window for that opens in June 15th, which is next week. And I'll go into that resource in a little bit. I do wanna point out other resources with regards to DATCAP um, has resources, financial resources for agricultural businesses and farmers specifically. And so if you fall into that area, that's another resource to look at. And then if you are, a uh, uh, Landlord for Residential, uh, DOA, um, the Department of Administration, also has a financial resource with regards to rental assistance programs to help assist with, um, with your, basically your tenants not being able to pay their rent. So with regards to We're All In, that's our new grant that's coming out. It's, it is part of the CARES Act. Um, we anticipate we're gonna be able to award 30,000 small businesses $2,500 grants to help cover business interruption, health and safety issues, if they need to adjust, right? So the plexiglass, things like that, that they may need to wanna to put into their stores. Um, all of those things cost money, um, but it can help with rent, mortgages, additional inventory, all of those things. The eligibility for it, you, you do need to be a for-profit Wisconsin-based business. You need to have 20 or fewer full-time equivalent employees. You have to earn, and this is your, your gross revenues, need to be between zero and a million dollars, and you had to be in business in February of 2020. The application materials are pretty straightforward, um, the, but there is a little twist in there. As I mentioned, we don't do anything without our partners. Um, so we do need um, your federal tax return, either 2018 or 2019. We do need a signed, this needs to be signed, W-9. And then you'll also need to know your NAICS code. And the big one right now actually is that you'll need a letter of acknowledgement from a community organization stating that you were in business in February of 2020. Um, and that can be any of those the businesses you see listed below, the Chamber of Commerce. Um, Advance has been a great partner in this and getting letters out. The municipality, your local bank. We are very fortunate in this region to have locally headquartered banks and some great partners with, between Nicolay and Associated and Community Investors Bank. Uh, so we've got some great opportunities for those banks to partner in. Even Capital Credit Union has, I know, been an active member in this. Um, our Business Improvement District. So I, I, I saw Jeff Marcus there. Please make sure you're writing letters on behalf of your businesses. Um, those are all eligible organizations. To, to write these letters of acknowledgement. Now they all need to be uploaded. The application process is not first come first serve. There is a scoring mechanism that we're looking at with regards to um, geographic location because we do wanna make sure that it's proportionally distributed through the state of Wisconsin. There also is a, a, a criteria for, well, I shouldn't say criteria, we, there's an evaluation of distress um, that we're using with regards to highly impacted co businesses that were highly impacted by COVID. And so we're looking at that as a factor as well. And then also the other factor is gonna be, if, if you did, you, we're not penalizing you, you can, you can still apply if you received other financial support, um, such as the PPP through SBA or the IDLE through SBA. Um, but it'll come into a factor if we have over 30,000 businesses applying. So it is something that we'll consider in that regard. I will say our FAQs have been actively adjusting as we continue to get calls on this and I would at the bottom of our of the screen you'll see the link for that it has it, all of our information regarding that and again as the FAQs can kind of continue to evolve so if you need more specific information on your tax return what type of you need what the document is um, as a, it'll be the application window will be open from the 15th through the 23rd so you have a little, little over a week to get the application in and then hopefully you, if you're aware of this, you're all working on getting the documentation ready. So I think that is my, from, in a nutshell, I don't know if anybody, Josh, if you have any questions that you wanna facilitate there or. Yeah, uh, thanks Nalita. We had a couple um, come in uh, and I think you just mentioned that if you, if you receive PPP funds, are you still eligible for the We're All In grant? I think you did uh, just address that. Um, 
so I think I think we're we're probably good there. Um, and the question, another question came in: Where do we find the NAICS three-digit code? Uh, is it is it on our taxes? That was the question. So there is a NAICS on your taxes, but uh, we've actually been figuring out that a number of businesses may not be using an accurate NAICS. So sometimes their business model changes, or you know, sometimes they may even be multiple NAICS, and so they kind of identify on that tax return, but maybe not necessarily fully identify the the business in its entirety. And so what we'll be using is what you identify on the application. The application will have a drop down menu that you can pull from that kind of helps identify that. So, so restaurants are its own NAICS code. It's the first three digits. Um, so for the most part, you're going to see that that drop down menu will be provided and you won't, you, if you fall outside of that, I would either encourage you to give us a call or, um, you can also you can easily look up NAICS code um, and just say you know, NAICS for this and it usually shows up pretty quickly within your Google search. Um, I actually that's part of our application for every business we work with and I you'll be surprised the number of businesses that don't put that on their application so we end up having to help identify that for them. It's a pretty common thing that we have to end up actually helping address. So we're hoping to make it easy with providing that drop down menu for businesses to identify within the application process. Thanks, Nalita. Uh, next question is, if you are a nonprofit running a retail store, are you eligible for the We're All In grant? Uh, no. Well, I, I should, so, knowing that the nonprofit world probably, if it's, if it's considered unrelated business income, are you running it separately? I guess would be the question. So nonprofits fall into a tricky world when they start doing unrelated business. And so you may have to identify that. My guess is it's going to be no. Um, my guess is you're trying to strategize it to keep it in the your 501c3. So th there are some additional resources out there for nonprofits. Um, so depending on the type of nonprofit that you are, I just I did work with UW Extension and UWGB on a webinar like this with regards to different resources for nonprofits. So I'm more than, if you want to shoot me an email, I'm more than happy to have that conversation and maybe help identify other resources for you. Great. Thanks, Nalita. And, you know, keep the uh, questions coming. I thought this was just, uh, since we're on the topic, we'll go ahead and address those right away. So keep the questions coming as they come to mind um, uh, throughout their, our time today. Um, with that, we'll uh, go ahead and hand it over to Ted. Um, and so go ahead and meet yourself, Ted, and uh, thanks for being here. Great. Thanks, Josh. So um, as part of public health's mission, we responded to the COVID-19 pandemic here locally in Brown County. And um, as we started getting to a certain point, um, some of the rumblings were that we want to reopen. And so we went into an offshoot of our 37 um, employee division went into how do we figure out how to provide a little bit more on the ground um, guidance for our local businesses, something that's a little bit more specific than CDC guidelines. And um, WEDC, we're still developing theirs. So we reached out to a number of the local business and industry associations, heard what they had to say, heard some of their best practices, and went to work on developing our own set of guidelines. Um, so that, so effectively we engage those business and industry leaders. We try to accommodate them, um, with most of their questions and frustration points that were most commonly heard from them and they basically relate to us. And so we went to work on that. We developed initially six different, um, sets of guidance ranging from restaurants, um, hotel industry, mobile food establishments office, retail, manufacturing, and, um, and then we added some here just recently. And so um, working through these, these points, it was kind of a challenge because um, from the strictly business aspect, there are certain things that you hear and say, and, and when you talk about it from a scientific perspective, it wasn't really the rubber meeting the road. So engaging those business and industry associations, I think really played a big part in how effective they've been and how asked for um, they've been. And actually, since they were released about three weeks ago, we've had a number of requests for different industry sectors. And um, as a result, 
Um, we are in final um, review and approval for a wedding guidance or wedding venue, wedding and event guidance, wedding and event venue guidance, and additional guidance under lodging with meeting space. And so there is a uh, more or less a very thin line in terms of the guidance and, you know, with the Safe Road Home Order and Badger Bounce Back. So we are working with our businesses countywide in terms of trying to provide on a proactive basis guidance to help keep them safe. Um, and so just to kind of reiterate that, there is not a current health order in place. In some other counties throughout the state there is, and other states there are, but there is not here in Brown County. Um, and so we want to be proactive in trying to um, work directly with the businesses in terms of ensuring that they're safe as they reopen. And so with that, um, we definitely encourage individual um, companies to call if they've got specific questions or concerns, or if they've heard or, or just, just need to walk through some of the things that they're thinking before they open, or as they've opened, if they've had some frustration points, we're there to kind of help walk them through and guide them through, at least from our public health hats. And, um, and so with that, um, it is a living, breathing document. The document I'm referring to is on our website at www.stayhealthybc.com. Um, the, the document, like I said, is a living, breathing um, document. So um, we're estimating that it'll be revised and um, put back up on our website. Um, sometime next week. At this time, the, the first revision or first edition is on there, but the second revision is anticipated to come up very soon. With that, that's basically in a nutshell what our document is and, and uh, so, um, and who it supports the, the various industry sectors. And that's who we heard most loudly from. And so on our second wave, we've heard from a couple more industries and if there's there's more rumblings and more interest, we will consider looking at more specific guidance just to Brown County. Great, thanks Ted. Um, I'm sure we'll have some questions later on uh, as it relates to some of those things as well. So uh, appreciate those insights. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to um, uh, Addie. And I believe, Addie, you've got a presentation that I think Lauren, I believe Lauren's got queued up for you here. So, um, We'll uh, get that up here, and it's a great, uh, great perspective from a, from a local a local manufacturer. Yes, um, and Lauren, thank you for for bringing that up. As as I kind of introduced before, actually, if you want to hop on over to the next slide for me, Lauren, um, the very number one. There we go. As I mentioned before, um, we have eighteen hundred paper makers right here in the state of Wisconsin between Rhinelander, Mosin, um, De Pere, and Kakana, but we do have this global network of um, plants all around the world. And I would say in, in the beginning of the pandemic, that helped us because we, of course, were looking to a lot of our European colleagues. They were kind of dealing with the virus first. So we were able to truly um, help, you know, get their help and figure out, okay, what are the protocols and the different pandemic prevention plans that our European partners are putting into place and apply that very rapidly here in the US. Um, we are headquartered out of Helsinki, but we also have headquarters here in the United States in Pocono, Wisconsin. Next slide, please. So I wanted to just give you all, in case you're not completely familiar with the specialty nature of our business, uh, some just some broad view of some of the products that we make. And we were considered an essential business from day one, mostly because of the medical products we do make, uh, medical PPE, medicine patches, but we also um, have a huge impact in the food packaging and processing supply chain and um, shipping and packaging materials. So um, an example that you can probably all relate to during this time is that water activated security tape that goes over an Amazon package. Um, we make that. So we make all the base papers for that. So you can, you can imagine, I know I had a lot of Amazon um, packages coming during this time. I'm guessing many of you did as well. So um, one thing we also found was 
there were really dynamic times across the supply chain um, in different parts, whether our building and construction customers or we had different customers who maybe made a certain product, but then they were pivoting their business to respond to the pandemic. So we had to be, we had to be quick to pivot as well. Next slide, please. So obviously, um, you know, challenging times for our business across the globe, but we, we were required to rapidly and efficiently respond. So really what we did was in partnership with the European colleagues, as I mentioned before, um, we put pandemic prevention plans into place immediately. So by February, we ceased all um, travel. Um, we increased all of our internal health and safety protocol. And by early March, we created a Wisconsin-based crisis communications team. Um, and we still actually meet um, multiple times per week where we are reviewing procedures, protocols. I'm sure a lot of the businesses on this call can also relate to the fact that um, in the beginning, March and April, it seemed as though CDC, Department of Health, um, World Health, there were, there were new protocols and new pieces of information coming at us um, all the time. So really what we did by having this team of people really reviewing all of the different messages that were coming and we had to kind of translate for our employees um, what, what you need to know and how do we keep you healthy at work. By, by St. Patrick's Day, with the exception of our production employees, we mobilized everybody offsite and we still are offsite at this point. Next slide. So here is a view, and I do want to say too that um, if there's anything that you see that you might be able to apply for your small business as far as a procedure goes, um, any of the communications you see here, by all means, please reach out to the Chamber of Commerce and I can help adapt these forms or these procedures for your business. Um, this is an example of our intranet homepage that we created. So it has up-to-date information on what, you know, all the revised safer at home orders that were coming out. Um, we have messages, continuous messages from leadership. We have found that to be extremely important, especially as things are starting to loosen up and open up. Those continuous messages from leadership reminding people that the virus is still here and we have to be safe. Um, and also access to health and medical information. One thing that we have truly learned from this experience is our employees look to us for their news and information source. So we have found it imperative to have up-to-date information as soon as possible. Anytime the state makes a change or there's a local change, um, our employees are looking to us for the answers. So by having these ready-to-go communication methods, it keeps our managers sane as well as the employees feeling like they know what's going on. Next slide, please. So here are some additional, just a list of additional um, examples of ways that we helped create modified, I would say, existing, um, you know, procedures. We are a producer of food packaging and processing products. So we already follow strict health and safety guidelines. Um, you know, we're ISO, BRC, high hygiene certified, um, CGMP kosher certification. So we just felt as though we had to kind of take that and then create some new norms from that. Um, we also found it imperative to, to put immediate contractor screening in place. We are the type, we have large manufacturing facilities um, and we have people coming in and out all the time. So really implementing contractor screening and visitor screening was imperative for us. Um, we even modified our truck delivery process. So we made all of our deliveries as non-contact as possible. Um, and we even installed little separate booths. Now that's not possible at every business, especially small businesses, but the way, really what we had to do was take a look at existing procedures and try to figure out how do we make things as non-contact as possible. Next slide. Next slide, Lauren, did we get hung up? There we go. So you will find some additional examples here of, um, you know, the one thing that I wanna point out at the bottom there is this flow chart that we implemented. So as you're bringing employees back or as we you know, continue to see different spikes in numbers and things, what we found in order to keep, I will say, knock on wood, of all of our 2,000 employees in the state of Wisconsin, we have not had any positives in our plants. And I really believe, and we haven't had any kind of case spread, part of the reason, A, is in, you know, making it easy for people to call in and stay home if they are feeling any of the symptoms. We have this flow chart so that we can let people know um, within the management system if we do have somebody experiencing symptoms, 
What is the guidance that we give that person immediately? We have the, the action plan that you can see there that we are constantly updating and putting on the internet so people can you know, essentially say, okay, this is what I'm experiencing right now. What should I do with that? Um, and also we have levels one to three cleaning going on really that go beyond a CDC recommendation. So for instance, from March to this day, if we have an employee call in sick and say, you know what, I think I need to go get a COVID test or I have a low fever, I'm experiencing a cough, we instantly go out to that area where the person is working and we implement level three cleaning procedures. And I think by us just being proactive and making these moves and making it easier for the employees to call in, um, we have been able to keep our plants extremely safe. Next slide. So, you know, obviously, I, like I said before, I think a lot of these protocols might become the new normal. Um, we, were, we were actually commenting the other day that if we only would have put some of these, these protocols in place during cold and flu season in the past, we probably would have kept our employees healthy during those seasons as well. Um, the mask, masks, sanitizing levels, one through three cleaning are all continuing as part of our new normal for at least the duration of the year. Um, we are also learning that in the beginning, we had to kind of balance whatever state recommendations were in terms of the reopening process with our own recommendations and our own health and safety protocol. So we have found it in our business that we have had to go above and beyond whatever um, the state is recommending. We are just going to be a little bit more intense in our procedures simply because um, we just, we want to play it super safe. Um, we also realized that um, this has created a lot of extenuating challenges for our employees. Um, you know, people have had, you know, issues with compromised immune systems, or a lot of us have um, lost childcare, or our, you know, our kids weren't in school, things like that. So one thing that we have really worked to do is um, to really provide that continued support to our employees as they continue to transition in and out of the workplace, but also just realizing that this is an ever-changing, you know, moving target situation. So we're going to have to continue with a, this kind of mentality through the end of the year. Um, so really, really, that's what we have. You know, the other thing, you know, kind of props to Nalita, WEDC, and, um, you know, one thing that we found as a business was just really staying in tune with WEDC as a resource with our local county health departments. And then also, um, you know, really, if we did have a concern about something, reaching out directly to the governor's office and letting them know, you know, this is something that as a business we could use help with. So keep the lines of communication open as you're continuing to reopen your businesses. That's it. Thanks so much. That's such valuable uh, perspectives from from a manufacturer um, on, on the work that you're doing and are continuing, have done and will continue to do. So thank you for that perspective. Um, our, our next uh, panelist is uh, Amy. Um, and Amy, are, are you on? Maybe, maybe you've called in. I know we have a couple of numbers on here, so I don't see your name. But I will, uh, we'll go ahead hearing nothing from her. We'll just go ahead and continue to move on. And if she pops on in a little bit, we had uh, Amy from Lion's Mouth Bookstore. I don't see her on or hear her. So we'll go ahead and move on then to Jess uh, Miller from Hagermeister Park, um, talking a little bit about uh, perspective from uh, a, re or, or a, a restaurant's perspective. So Jess, uh, take it away. Okay. Um, yeah, we, we uh, put in a lot of new, uh, a new guide guidelines and things that uh, we're doing differently from uh, the pre-pandemic era. Um, a lot of the stuff we did um, was stuff from the CDC guidelines, you know, that we took from the CDC, the Brown County Health Department, uh, the Restaurant Association was uh, very helpful. Um, we took some things from the Tavern League and also the ABL, American Beverage Licensees. And we just kind of came up with our our own um, policies. And uh, to start with, um, we had to create new areas uh, within the restaurant. Um, we came up with a main sanitizing station. Um, that's where like the condiments and um, utensils and stuff are stored and cleaned. Um, we have two areas uh, basically the, where they come in not sanitized and where we keep them after they are sanitized and we have a, a person um, on each shift that's uh, in charge of that. Um, we also, um, because of the rise in business and 
uh, pickups and deliveries, uh, we created another area uh, that was more convenient and uh, we were able to keep cleaner and kind of an out of the way area where um, these employees won't have as much contact with other employees and they could get their stuff and go. So those were uh, two new areas that we had to add. Um, we also added positions to each of the busier shifts. Um, first of all, uh, we added an additional host at the front door. Um, needed person. Uh, we didn't, you know, even in the foyers, we left the doors, uh, the inner doors open. Uh, just less chances to, um, for people, the, you know, the high touch areas. Um, also, that person, uh, we had to, that extra person, uh, was in charge of uh, cleaning door handles, uh, bathroom door handles, uh, and that type of stuff throughout the throughout the uh, restaurants. We also have a main sanitizing station person. Um, that person um, was in charge of uh, cleaning off guest checks, um, sanitizing the salt and pepper shakers, as well as uh, the other condiments, uh, ketchup and mustard bottles. Um, making sure that um, napkins were um, in containers that were um, covered. Um, also, they assisted in um, sanitizing the handles throughout the, the building. And we had a clean item table, and that's where the, you know, that, that additional person uh, was, uh, you, you know, they, they had the gloves on and uh, the rest of the sanitizing agents uh, to help keep things clean. Um, we changed our, the way we do menus. Uh, we are no longer using our physical menus. Uh, we, are, we have a QR code uh, that is our uh, type of, um, we'd like to use it, so we encourage the guests to, to use the QR code. And on that QR code, it has our menu. Um, it has our drink menus, it has our upcoming events, um, and things like that. And if a person doesn't want to use their phone uh, to, use, to get the QR code, uh, we do have disposable paper menus available to them. So, also the silverware uh, was uh, kind of a question mark. Um, so we are using uh, silverware, and uh, the sanitizing person is um, in charge of that. Um, once, you know, with gloves, obviously, they um, wrap the silverware and put them in uh, covered uh, covered containers, and they're, the covered containers are brought to the table, and uh, the guests can uh, pick out, you know, their utensils. So we, we do that. Uh, face masks, all, all, all employees um, are required uh, to have face masks and wear them throughout their shift, uh, back of the house, front of the house. And we have server aprons that we issue um, out to each of um, the servers. Now, we issue the face mask and the aprons, and um, we do wash them for them each day. So we check them in, check them out, and get them washed every night. Um, as employees come in, we do take their temperature, and we have them sign off on the COVID-19 symptoms and uh, before each shift, and also encourage them not to come into work um, if they have any of these uh, symptoms beforehand. So that's all part of it. Also doing things like the hand washing and the mask videos. Um, so um, we went online and found a couple uh, hand washing videos that we require all, all our employees to watch and we created our own mask video and to show them how to to fold them and when they're not in use and uh, how to store them when they're not in use and how to use them and encourage them from not uh, touching their face as you know try to do it as infrequent as possible plastic gloves are worn by most employees uh, they're worn by the, the entire back of the back of the house staff um, the clean item person has them on, and the curbside, curbside pickup runners have them on. Uh, we don't have them required for uh, bartenders and the delivery drivers at this point. Um, social distancing for the tables that we have in our restaurants. 
Uh, we have six feet in between all tables and chairs. And we, it, where we have booths, we basically have an X in between every other one uh, to be, be compliant with the six foot rule. So we're also um, probably the most challenging area is the social distancing at the bar itself. Um, you know, we're, we put um, X marks in between group areas and, um, you know, we've had some success with that. So um, the maximum number of guests we have, um, we have eight person tables. So we allow up to eight people at a table. Uh, we don't like to push any more tables together or um, go over that eight person rule. So we're trying to hold to that. Um, we no longer use our customer shuttle as of right now, um, encouraging Lyft and Uber, and they have some really great programs uh, in place um, that um, comply with uh, CDC guidelines. Uh, money handling and bill payment has uh, definitely been a, a bit of a challenge too. Um, we do as many tabs as we can at the bar instead of uh, having cash payments. And obviously the, the bartenders and the servers uh, after every, every single cash handle uh, must wash and sanitize their hands. And the same thing goes when they're uh, touching uh, credit cards, you know, um, cleaning of pens uh, in between each use. And we went to a no straw policy. Uh, so the bartenders wouldn't have to um, have any contact with uh, straws that go in, in drinks. And right now we have a 50% a um, private party rule. Uh, we haven't taken any, we haven't had any parties yet. Uh, we are starting to book a few and uh, they will start in July. And as of right now, we're only using 50% of the occupancy of, of the rooms. Um, we also have a, a promise um, that we adopted from uh, the National Restaurant Association and the Wisconsin Restaurant Association, um, and it's on their website not, as well as on our website, and it's uh, basically a promise to, um, to the customer, and also, you know, we're asking the customers to um, do their part in this by, uh, you know, following, following the rules and um, buying by the the social distancing so that's uh, kind of the the gist of uh, what we're doing thanks Jess appreciate it uh, a couple a couple questions came through um, as we move to our, our Q&A time one specifically for you Jess from Nalita um, wondering uh, about how social distancing has impacted capacity we haven't had a whole lot of problem yet um, People haven't come out in droves, I would say. Um, so it hasn't been a, a big issue as of yet. Um, you know, we, I do anticipate as the summer goes along that, uh, you know, we'll have more uh, challenges there. Uh, people have wanted to be outside for the most part. Um, so the outside dining has been uh, very popular. Um, and we might have to, you know, it, it's been a big, big help. Um, that some of the municipalities have allowed us to uh, stretch out onto the sidewalks and also to whether it's um, using um, areas that um, like your sidewalks or your uh, parking lot areas and be able to stretch your outside area. So that's helped out a lot. Thanks, Jess. Um, we had a question come through uh, related to uh, body temp scanning and uh, and screening. Uh, what technology is being used? Are people hiring outside third parties to conduct the screening? And maybe just an open discussion on that from from uh, our panel today. We purchased um, just. They, are, they were online, $60 temperature readers, and uh, that's uh, they've been working pretty well, I believe. Yeah, just to follow on to what Jess said, what we've seen a lot of uh, across the spectrum is the, the touchless infrared thermometers that have been used. Um, and I guess probably the biggest um, question mark is if and how they're used on customers 
and then specifically um, policies for when they're used with employees and how they're screened when they come in. And some of that gets into HIPAA compliance issues. And uh, so in terms of how that's kind of been applied, it's been kind of across the spectrum. Yes, to Ted's point on that, we found that we were trying to use the contactless thermometers in an outdoor setting and any kind of the, the, the temperature, if, you if you're not in a perfectly temperature controlled area that can really throw off your results. Um, in addition to that, we really had to have one dedicated person or one of our Oc Health nurses kind of be that temperature screening person. So we actually, um, we, we spoke to a lot of other heavy manufacturers in the area and we now only um, are doing the temperature testing for cause or for suspected symptoms because quite frankly, the, the process of doing the pre-screening um, really, we don't know that we were getting the accurate results because of all of those other factors. Uh, related to that, another question came through specific to, to Jess. Uh, are your customers required to wear masks until they eat or, or what is your policy uh, there? We have not uh, required them to wear masks coming into the building. Um, Nalita posted uh, in the chat that WDC has, has a mechanism to find PPE. So that link is in our chat. Thanks for sharing that and Nalita, really appreciate it. A um, couple other questions that came through here that I and will get to, uh, so maybe specifically for Addy, um, uh, what has been the attitude for uh, regarding the um, measures that you've taken uh, from your employees? Uh, is there pushback? Are people pretty uh, compliant? And, and how have you communicated that to your employees? Um, and how will you continue to do that moving forward? That's a really good question. I would say in the beginning, um, there was a bit of pushback between the differences and speaking very transparently here, the differences between the individuals that were allowed to work from home because we are non-production employees as opposed to those who were working on the front lines. And um, there was fear, right? I mean, we there was a lot of unknowns about this virus and the way it was spreading and how it was affecting people. So in the beginning, those those production folks, the frontline workers had a lot of concerns, but that's why we implemented so many of the health and safety protocols immediately. Um, and then once it got to be, I would say by early April and there was a regular cadence of the protocols, people felt much more comfortable. Um, then of course there was the implementation of the CDC guidelines on mask use. And the one thing that we have found with the masks and I can highly recommend it to anybody else is just make sure your employees have options, especially now that we're entering into the summer months and it's a bit more uncomfortable. Um, we have found that um, we provide, um, you know, the, the thicker cloth mask, the gator style, um, the disposable, or we actually, we actually worked with a company, um, Stormy Cromer, they make the Stormy Cromer hats. They turned over their production lines um, a couple months ago and we actually worked on creating what we call a summer style mask that has a little bit, better breathability and better wicking, um, sweat wicking to it. So we have found that while people are not necessarily still, you know, excited about the fact that they have to wear a mask for a significant period of time, as long as we provide options and we provide breaks and we create all of the best comfort as possible, people are on board and they understand that we're, by us doing the right things, we've kept everybody healthy. Thanks, Addy. Any, uh, um, Jess, do you want to uh, address that question as well um, as it relates to pushback from employees and how you're communicating that? Sure. Um, yeah, there's definitely been some pushback um, wearing masks. Um, you get some comments from customers at times that you, you, know, you have to deal with, but for the most part, I think uh, most of the customers have been uh, very receptive to the, to the things we're trying to do. Um, you know, kind of like um, she said, is having different style of masks has, have, have definitely made a difference. Um, we do give employees uh, breaks a little more often now, especially the, the, the back of the house kitchen employees where it is already pretty hot back there. Um, you know, give them time to go outside and, you know, take the mask off and, you know, breathe for a while. 
And uh, we do have the, the extenders, the plastic extenders, because, you know, sometimes they can get a, a little bit uncomfortable around the ears. So if you, if you can provide different options, um, you know, with the mask, the extenders, and, and giving them breaks, um, you can kind of alleviate some of the pushback. Mm. Jess, this is a follow-up question that came in uh, for you. Do you need a license from the city to, to spread out? Yes, um, you do. Each municipality has um, been a little bit different. Um, you know, we've had to contact, uh, you know, several different, we, we have eight locations. So, um, you know, we're dealing with different municipalities. Uh, Oshkosh, for instance, was uh, very easy. It was one phone call. Um, you could get it done over the phone. Um, in Wausau, it was very easy. Uh, that pretty much the same thing. It was, uh, you know, they emailed you a, a permit. You filled it out, sent it in, and it was done. Um, Green Bay is, is um, you know, it's a little more uh, cumbersome in the process. Um, there's more things to fill out, um, but they do have a, a path to, to, get the, to get that type of stuff done. Um, so yeah, check, check with each municipality and it's all a little bit different, but um, it, it's definitely worth it. Hey Josh, if I could add something with regards to mm -hmm. the, like, I guess the, the comfort and ability with regards to mask and how people are reacting and things like that. I do know that the state is working on a, a marketing campaign to really help adjust mentality, right? That this is, this is, this is the normal. We need to protect each other, right? Again, we're all in. It's not, you, you don't wear the mask to protect you. You wear the mask to protect your neighbor. And so it, you, we're working on some strategies to help build that as the norm and make sure people are comfortable and, and the expectation is set. I do know of other counties that are also working on those initiatives. I don't know, I haven't heard if Brown is working on that quite yet. Um, but I, like I said, I do know other areas that are trying to really help build that just comfort level to say, hey, this is, this is how we're gonna take care of each other and we're gonna, we're gonna help protect one another and keep our community safe. Thanks for that, Nalita. Um, again, if there are other questions, feel free to chat those in. Um, we had a, a new one here. Um, I guess this would be for, for anyone, maybe specifically for Nalita and Ted. Are there any uh, misconceptions or clarifications? There's so much information out there right now. Are there any uh, clarifications that, um, that you would, you know, would want to share or big misconceptions that, that you have heard uh, to date that you feel like, hey, just you know, heads up, you don't have to fill in the blank or we're asking you to fill in the blank. Any, any overarching themes that, uh, that you want to share with the business community today? From Brown County Public Health, um, probably one of the biggest things is uh, reducing or preventing the spread of COVID-19. Probably one of the best measures is the physical distancing aspect. Um, two of the other kind of things that we've seen along the roads is um, uh, disposable gloves are great, but they're not a, you should not have a false sense of security. So, um, you know, there's still single use for the most part and you should still wash your hands thoroughly before and after putting and taking them off. Um, and that's not just in the restaurant industry, that's across where, wherever they're being used. Um, and then the last piece would be that the cloth masks. Um, one of the things that we're looking at to Nalita's point um, with Brown County is um, we're considering uh, a campaign with cloth masks for people to use them. And the, the concept is I'm not wearing it to protect me, I'm wearing it because I care about you. So kind of going to that we're all in theme. Yeah, and I, I would echo that. I think that's the biggest thing that from a safety standpoint, it's, it's that misconception of really what are these things doing for each other, right? Um, and I think the other piece that I would say is, you know, everybody's looking for resources, and there are there are a number of resources out there. I know SBA um, with the idle and the PPP are pretty much, you know, used up. Um, the SBA still has their 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 six month payment period though for SBA loans. So if you take out a new SBA loan, the SBA will cover six months of payments of principal and interest. Um, on that loan, as well as if you have an existing SBA loan, they do cover that the six months of payments and principal and interest as well on your loan to help obviously help address COVID. Um, 
and even today, you know, honestly, municipalities across the state are still coming up with resources. We know there's there are needs out there, and we're trying to address that. That's hopefully where um, we're all in. It helps at least a little bit with a lot of these businesses. I know 2,500 is not a lot in the big picture of everything, but it hopefully helps address some of those those initial um, costs that have been incurred over the course of time. Thanks, Ted and Nalita. Um, we've got, we have just a few minutes left today. Um, are there is there anybody that has any questions that did did not have a chance to chat in? Maybe you're on the phone or unable to to type in. Um, if you have any questions and and want to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask our our panel, now would be the time to do that. So I'll just give it a second to see if anybody's got any additional questions. hearing none. Um, thanks everybody for being on today and, and to our, uh, our businesses as well as uh, Nalita and, and Ted for sharing your insights today. Um, continue to use the Greater Green Bay Chamber as a resource uh, for your businesses moving forward. We have uh, our website, greatergbc.org uh, slash we still mean business. We have all these resources on there and we're updating that uh, continuously um, as we move into opening uh, and continuing to open for business. So thanks everybody for being here and uh, feel free again to reach out to the chamber for continued updates moving forward. So with that, I hope everybody has a, a great day and uh, stay safe. Thanks so much. Thank you, Josh.